Th thank you, Andrew. Please allow me to uh, introduce myself and the panel. My name is Ho Yun Nam. I am a partner at the law firm Sword and Kistel. We're uh, based in the United States. We're joined by four distinguished leaders of the industry. Uh, in no particular order, I have Vasilios Marulis, uh, Global Head of uh, Shipping at City. Shmuel Yaskowitz, Chief Executive Officer, Express Feeders. Alan Hatton, the CEO of Four Guard Shipping. Eric Lewenhout, President at Concordia Maritime. So this is the last panel of the conference and uh, I think our job is to maybe reflect upon the themes that have been discussed throughout the conference and, and to look forward to the future with some predictions, um, you know, at least for the near term future. There's a lot here and uh, we can probably only scratch the surface, but uh, just to start off, if I could maybe summarize the conference in one word, it would be decarbonization. I think from an owner's perspective, uh, perhaps the immediate action item is the EEXI and CII. So here's a question for the owners in the panel. How are you preparing to comply with these new IMO mandates? Um, what challenges are you faced with? Maybe we start with you, Alan. That helps. Um, well, we've actually gone through a process whereby the, the ships that we owned in the main, we've sold and chartered back over the last uh, year. I mean, and I think around some of the themes that we've been talking about during the conference and, and that we're all aware of at the moment, we saw risks in terms of residual um, value, in terms of increasing inflationary pressure, moving um, OPEX up generally, um, that having a knock-on effect globally in terms of inflation and then interest rate rises and things. So we, we took the view about a year ago that it might make sense to, to, to sell and charter back and that's actually reduced our uh, operating cost of the ships and our break-evens, which has been quite quite helpful. That's meant that we don't directly control the operation of the ships from a technical perspective, and we rely on our, um, our providers of tonnage to do that now. But it does mean that obviously that comes into play. I mean, um, where we're seeing the bigger effects is is more on how it's affecting supply. I mean, in, in the small tanker market, we're, we're in chemicals primarily. Um, it's already, from a um, supply perspective, We've seen, you know, almost net contraction, um, and that's what we're likely to see because of um, limited f fleet growth, very small order book, um, and what have you. So, actually, what we think is that the the impact is more likely to help us from a, the perspective of reducing that supply further. Ships are likely to slow down; they're likely to move longer distances, and so we're looking more about how it can impact us positively than what we have to do too much in terms of um, changing things, the way we operate. Eric. Concordia is a public company listed in Sweden. Are there any unique challenges um, as a public company in complying with these uh, new regulations? I think we, um, I think we have high, high expectations from, uh, from our shareholders. Um, as you know, uh, uh, Scandinavians are, are uh, particularly keen and sensitive when it comes to sustainability. So uh, I think our, our shareholders, and, and, and we share this, uh, expect us to uh, to do the right thing um, when it comes to our fleet, which is uh, mainly product tankers, um, we are not too concerned uh, at now. We are reviewing the the benchmarks that uh, for for emissions uh, and uh, efficiency. I think for the older ships, it will be. Uh, prudent investments in, in efficiency and for younger ships we are doing our homework when it comes to uh, upgrading um, and looking on uh, all the alternatives in terms of uh, alternative fuel or uh, potentially carbon capture. Shmuel, um, I'm still a student of you know, the technical aspects of these ratings, how, how they're calculated. Um, you own feeder vessels, and uh, you know we talked about uh, you know given the nature of your your assets and client base, customer base, um, you, know, you you have some unique challenges um, in 
complying with these uh, new regulations. Maybe uh, you can talk to us about that. Yeah, uh, it's not maybe a global problem, but there is specific problem for feeders, uh, especially in the more problematic part, the CII, if you know how the, it's calculated, so it's uh, fuel consumption times a CO2 factor, and it is divided by the distance travel and the uh, capacity. This is, makes it immediately more difficult for smaller vessels because they are less efficient. But talking about feeders calling uh, third world uh, ports, meaning that we are standing a lot, meaning the numerator uh, is increasing by consuming a bunker, but uh, the denominator is not increasing because we are not moving. And uh, we've done our studies and there are certain trades that almost regardless of what uh, vessel you put on them, you can put the most modern vessel that you want, they will still be a, a D or an E on a CII. This was discussed in the last IMO uh, meetings, and uh, there was a suggestion to put a correction or an adjustment factor, like it is putting on a reefer uh, uh, tarkeridon uh, and vessels, and it was not uh, approved. It will be discussed again, if I'm not mistaken, in 2025. And this can have uh, a big effect on uh, again, on, on uh, the third world countries. Take, for example, a Jeddah Port Sudan, where you uh, steam for 12 hours and you can stand for 30 days. Which owner will agree to put a vessel into uh, this port? We are an, an owner and an operator, so in theory, we can play around with vessel. We can put six months of vessel into this port and then take out and put another vessel. But which third party owner will agree to put his vessel there? And this can have dramatic effects. And by the way, not only third world. Take Rotterdam. You need to call four or five terminals in Rotterdam if you're a feeder. It will dramatically affect uh, the uh, CII rating. And this is a concern. We've talked a lot about ESG throughout the conference. Um, you know, banks and insurance companies are increasingly requiring ESG-related covenants. Um, and principles, for example, and sometimes they, they give you incentives such as interest margin reductions um, depending on your ESG performance. Um, maybe, uh, Eric, how do you feel about uh, the increasing focus on ESG aspects of your operations? Well, for a, for a, for a small company like, like ours, uh, of course, the, the immediate effect will be that uh, you have um, uh, a severe increase in uh, administration and, uh, and reporting. Um, having said that, uh, I think we are uh, slowly and gradually coming to a point where you will have uh, a much more universal set of reporting factors and once that is established, it will, it will ease uh, this, this burden, which uh, it is on a, on a small, uh, small uh, operation. Uh, for a larger company where you have different departments, resources, and so on, I think uh, it's, uh, it's, it may already be taken care of. But for us, uh, it will be a, a challenge uh, for starters, and it will also be a challenge for our, our technical managers. Would you have any, any thoughts, Alan? Um, sorry, I would, I, I would echo that. I mean, again, we're a small owner. Um, the, the increase in terms of you know, workload and administration is one thing. I think, as I mentioned, um, you know, we've moved away from straight asset financing and ownership. We've moved to slightly kind of more asset-like model. But I mean, I think it's been a good step, a step in the right direction for the banks to be focused on on ESG. I mean, I'd like to see it more about the whole life cycle of ships from building to scrapping as opposed to just the, the emissions and things like that. But obviously, it's, that creates even more work. Um, but I mean, I think from our perspective, you know, the, the focus has been how can we run the ships in the most kind of effective and efficient way? And, and that leads into the ESG um, solutions as well. So I mean, we're not seeing a huge impact in the way that we do business because if we operate efficiently, then, then usually that's the best op option in the, in, in the long run anyway. Vasilius, um, from a banker's perspective, do you think uh, ESG-based pricing grids um, are soon going to be a norm? I think, uh, I think increasingly, uh, yes, you're going to see it. I think uh, more and more, uh, 
it's it's front and center. You can hear it across in each and every uh, discussion. It's there, and increasingly, the owners that are willing to start the journey, because we know that there is no answer at the moment. Clearly, there are incre the the efforts, the collective efforts of this industry, uh, are such so significant that we're beginning to see, you know. And increasingly, in all the discussions that we are having with all of the clients, and it's you're beginning to sense that there is light at the end of the tunnel, that there are solutions that they're beginning to contemplate and beginning to you know commit significant capital uh, there. And on the back of that, uh, we are there to support that journey. We are there to see how we can assist and. An ESG uh, pricing grid is just one of the tools. I wouldn't say that it's the most significant tool, it's just a token if you wish, but are increasingly and, and more frequently will be part of the mix and you know, you, I can easily see significant pricing reductions for those that are willing to, to take the steps and, uh, and proceed down a path which ultimately leads to solutions. Uh, switching gears a bit, let's maybe talk about availability of financing. I, I am a financing lending lawyer by trade, and obviously this is a topic that piques my interest. Um, throughout the conference, we've, we've all heard plenty about the rising interest rate. And uh, in addition, there's a sense that at least for certain um, segments of the market, uh, maybe we're nearing a top of the cycle. But on the flip side, um, you know, throughout the pandemic, uh, a lot of borrowers have paid down their debt and uh, improved their cash positions. So here's a question for you, Vasilius. Uh, do Alan, Shmuel, and uh, Eric here need to worry about access to financings in the near future? Look, um, first of all, um, City, uh, we are a corporate financier. We're not an asset financier. We're not interested in asset financing specifically, so it's not about an LTV play. 20% you know, LTV, good. 80% you know, LTV, you know, no way, or 90%. It's, we look at the corporate, we look at the relationship, and on that basis, we, we judge. And therefore, LTV is not a, you know, if someone has long-term employment, then LTV is, to a certain extent, potentially even irrelevant. But at the same point in time, for sure, over the past few years, there has been a differentiation between smaller, if you wish, shipping companies and larger shipping companies. And uh, as smaller shipping companies have seen a significant reduction of capital allocation from the banks and larger shipping companies have seen, and therefore that has created a significant divergence in terms of pricing between the two. You've seen shipping, smaller ones, even if they're very healthy, not having access to capital, and larger ones, which could be, you know, done a completely different path strategically, you know, having significant access to capital and significant compression of pricing. I think for us as an institution, for sure this is one thing that is in play, but at the same point in time, increasingly, and most importantly, I can see it, uh, is going to be, what is your strategy going forward? Because we can see clearly potentially large shipping companies which currently are not having concrete strategies for the future. Uh, whether it is because they don't believe that it's the right time for them to engage, but at the same point in time, regardless of size, I think size and strategy will begin to blend and ultimately smaller companies that have concrete strategies that lead to um, where we also want to go and where we want to deploy capital will be ones that we partner with rather than just, oh my God, you know, it's a very large shipping company, let's go and bank them. So I think that's one element of it. I think on the other side, in terms of portfolio, I look at the portfolio that we have and across all the segments, I am cautiously optimistic. Now, of course, you can't, you can't rule out black swan events, course, and we are in a geopolitical uh, age where tension is significant, and therefore, who knows? But if one looks at the fundamentals, 
And yes, increasing inflation, increasing interest rates, potential significant recession in Europe. Let's see what's happening in North America and Asia. All of that together points to a, you know, a cautious approach, but a cautiously optimistic approach. And I think out of all the segments in the near term, I see uh, a positive sentiment. Now, there are some which you can easily see that in, in the next few years there will be significant pressure, and we're already seeing in some of them uh, significant softening. So it's going to be a mix and match. It's going to be interesting. Shipping is always interesting. Uh, you know, you wake up every day and you're like, oh my God, what has happened now? But at the same point in time, it's exciting, and that's why we're all here. Alan, do you, do you worry about rising debt service cost, um, access to financing? Um, not particularly. I don't think that things have changed from our perspective too much. Um, we're, as I say, we're quite a small owner, and I think you know, kind of one of the one of the points there is, it generally, a lot of banks are still looking at corporate deals rather than asset deals, and so we know that we're not in the sweet spot for a lot of the big banks and haven't been. Um, and so every deal that we've had to do in the past has been a little bit more creative. We've been looking at different markets. We've been finding solutions in Japan, in Korea, in, in, in other places, um, working more with alternative finances than big banks, although we, we've got a lot of support from a particular um, financial institution as well. Um, I think really, from the people that I've been talking to, the is issue has been the lack of projects rather than the lack of money um, and the lack of good projects. And, and I think that's kind of where the, the crunch has been. And certainly, when you're looking at, at some of the alternative finances, looking at things to do with the re-entry of the bigger banks and the pricing actually coming down or tightening, uh, it's taking them out of the, out of the game a little bit. Um, so, so no, it's not something that we've actively worried about. And as I say, we've kind of changed our model a little bit and, and, and meant that we're not reliant on, on financing, particularly at the moment. Eric, what about upgrading technologies on your fleet? Uh, is that going to be a capital intensive project that's going to need a lot of finance? Well, I guess you can, you can always get financing. The, the question is what you have to pay. But um, um, uh, as, as a small company, I think for us it's been uh, extremely important uh, during the past couple of years when uh, you know, markets has been has been tough uh, to be very transparent with our with our lenders and with our banks and keep keep that uh, close relationship uh, that we have. Um, I think they are uh, aware of that the industry is uh, is uh, will need investments, but uh, luckily this coincides with uh, with a strong market. I mean. Uh, you know, we are we are a bit at, at crossroads now when it comes to uh, uh, to fuels, to technology, and so on. But at least for the for the tanker business, that is, um, the market is strong. There is uh, potentially cash available to to do this uh, type of investments, which there hasn't been for for a few years. So um, I think it, we should be grateful that that we're in this situation now and, and not uh, a couple of years ago when, when markets were, uh, were uh, very tough. Um, just on a final note on, on, um, on, on banks, I mean one thing that, that we see is, is uh, among the Scandinavian banks maybe in particular but, but uh, also others is, uh, is the sort of hesitancy of uh, financing uh, drilling and offshore. So uh, we'll just see how that will uh, if it will affect uh, tanker business, uh, crew tankers perhaps uh, going forward, or not, um, but, um, but we'll see. Shmuel, I think uh, uh, you said you were a uh, banker in your prior, prior life. Uh, any, any thoughts on the topic, uh, um, you know, access to financing in the shipping industry? No, I, I wasn't a, a banker, but I was in finance uh, all my career in the shipping side. I just want to highlight one thing. Uh, I agree with Vasilius that we are seeing a two-tier market, and one of the effects in container shipping, at least, is uh, the di almost the disappearance of the Trump tonnage and the Trump owners, because there are no banks anymore that will uh, finance speculative buying. And for many years, the feeder business has relied on liquidity provided by mainly uh, European, mainly German owners, where they would uh, build vessels on speculation and shelter them short term. This uh, is almost impossible to do today. 
and uh, it will, together with the fact that the main lines have bought quite a lot of uh, the free tonnage, will be very interesting to see how it will affect uh, long-term uh, container shipping because you, it will be quite difficult unless there is a lot of uh, sub-chartering from uh, main lines to get to tonnage if you are not an owner. Uh, so we'll see, unless you are committed for long term. Switching gears again, another phrase that we've heard throughout the conference is, is energy transition. Um, our European friends have been, you know, plenty of times told us during these cocktail hours uh, you know, about their electricity bills. Um, winter is coming for them, um, literally and figuratively speaking. Um, you know, energy independence, energy security, you know, all these phrases uh, we've heard throughout the conference. It's an urgent topic that, uh, that uh, a lot of the nations throughout the world are going to have to grapple with. Um, Eric, um, being a tanker owner, how does a rapid, or even if it's not so rapid, energy transition affect, um, you know, your company's vision? Um, I think what's, what's been very clear in, in Europe in, in the past, uh, past few months is that energy security trumps energy transition. Um, people are, are generally concerned about uh, heating their homes for winter and uh, when we get to that stage then you know, whatever energy source is available is, is going to be used. Having said that, uh, yes we are for sure in, in, a, in a transitional phase, I mean uh, no one can sort of deny the effects of, of global warming uh, when you look on the, on the weather events that's, that's happening around us. Um, for the tanker industry, um, I think, to be honest, uh, I wouldn't be, at least for product tankers, I wouldn't be that concerned. Also, renewable fuels, e-fuels, methanol, call it what you want, will need transporting going forward. So I think the demand is still there. It may take a slightly different shape, but, uh, but, but it's still there. Alan, the same question. Um, well, I mean, I certainly echo the thoughts in terms of energy security now being more near-term near near -term importance than, than transition, and, and, but I don't necessarily think that's put the brakes on longer-term developments. I think what it's meant is that the, the, the kind of energy, um, the energy that's used in different places now has changed a little bit in terms of uh, re by requirement rather than um, any other reason. But what we are seeing from a tanker perspective, and it goes you know, through the market, and one of the reasons why things have, have become a little bit firmer is that it, different products are moving from to and from different places over longer distances. Um, so that, that, to a degree, ha has been helpful for our markets. It goes all the way down to the smaller tonnage as well because the, the swing tonnage and the larger tonnage pulls the, that market up. Um, we, I think, as a small owner, are unlikely to be um, the driver of change. We're going to be a participant if we can, obviously, but it's difficult for us to go ahead and decide on an investment um, and work out which fuel is going to be the right one to invest in for 10 years or 15 years time. Um, certainly we watch with interest and, and we're, uh, and I think it's interesting as well in terms of it's, there's still going to be a market for the ships that we have. Things are going to move, as, as Eric mentions. So, I mean, I think at this point, we're very interested to see what is taken on. We can see the, the issues with renewables, the issues with methanol, the issues with ammonia, and all the different fuels that are being um, championed. But at the moment, it seems very much that the fuel that we burn is going to be what we're burning in the near term, um, with perhaps LNG coming in a little bit more over the next five, ten years. I'll stay with you, Alan. Um one of the reasons for the rising energy cost in, in Europe is, of course, the uh, economic sanctions on, on Russia. You know, this is a, coming from the United States. This is a topic that's always on my mind. Um, the sanctions the regulations tend to be um, sort of driven by U.S. policies. Um, and, uh, you know, how, how has it been for you as an owner of an operating business that has global connections, um, sort of navigating through these complex um, sanctions regulations? Um, well, I mean, I think it's fairly straightforward. I think you make the decision whether or not you want to position your tonnage in such a way that you avoid sanctioned business, or you'll find some people that embrace it and decide to earn the premium. Um, we certainly don't fall into the latter. I mean, we, 
uh, would fall foul in terms of the support that we get from stakeholders um, if we were to do business which was deemed sanctioned. So, you know, it's a very clear line for us. We, we continue doing the trades that we had been doing. Um, it's very clear to see where ships go these days. AIS, etc., cetera, um, is, is difficult um, to, to, to get around and, and we're not looking to. So, I mean, I think business as usual, really, from our perspective. It's the same trades that we, that we were doing before. Obviously, when, um, and mainly because there wasn't a great deal of, of our kind of products moving out of areas that are now sanctioned anyway. But, uh, you know, the reality is we have to abide by international rules, effectively. And for you, Vasilius, as a financing bank, you sometimes have to play the role of something like an enforcer um, of these uh, sanctions regulations in that um, the bank, for the bank, uh, the risk is just too great um, if you're dealing with US dollars. You have to ensure that your borrowers are complying with these sanctions. How, how do banks navigate around these regulations in a changing world? Look, um, it's, it's something that we have zero tolerance. I mean, we are, of course, a US institution. Um, the, this is something that is taken extremely seriously and ultimately regardless of how important these are you know relationship killing uh, events so the clients that bank with us do uh, abide with uh, US of course and international sanctions which we of course abide with and ultimately should should those in any sort of way be breached then ultimately you know Unfortunately, or fortunately, the, the corresponding counterparty will see the full force of the bank uh, uh, against them. There's no debate, and ultimately, you know, in, many, in, in such an occasion, a potential occasion, ultimately will not be in the hands of the relationship ma management team. And as a result of the potential franchise implications, you know, there's not going to be a debate. And, you know, and we are talking about a especially in situations and especially for shipping companies which are, you know, most of it is dollar, uh, all the flows, the assets are in dollars and everything else. You are talking about cardiac uh, arrest without a, uh, a bypass uh, operation to be there to be performed. So it's very serious and uh, extremely important. If I can say one thing about energy transition and, uh, and energy security, because I think it's extremely important to just state it, which is what is transpiring, especially with regards to city as an institution. It's not, you know, and that's why I will echo what Eric said and, and Adam is, this is not a, a, an attack if you wish to fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are required. What, what is transpiring, what is, you know, what we are trying to, to address and look at is emissions and therefore you know we, no one lives in a you know we don't go into this mystical place the offices and suddenly feel that you know everything's going to be renewables tomorrow and you know we're going to drive hydrogen cars and all of that stuff yes potentially in the future and that's what we aim to but ultimately fundamentally what we want is a reduction of emissions which is harming the environment and therefore you know is that carbon capture on board of conventional vessels? You know, that's something that we're going to look at. Is that LNG? Yes, absolutely. Is that whatever else solution? And the same goes for, of course, as a direct result. It's not that someone is foreseeing that suddenly the tanker market would just disappear. That's not going to happen. But how do the owners that carry that oil and how do the one, you know, the companies and, you know, and the households that burn so people address the emissions, that's what we care about, and that's what we're trying to address. Uh, so I think it's an important distinction. It's not, you know, and, and of course, that undoubtedly will create, and we're seeing it already, new trade routes, which for tanker operators and multiple others could be significant in the future. Things, you know, trade routes that do not exist at the moment, asset classes which do not exist at the moment, suddenly could appear, which could be very significant and very meaningful from a shipping point. Interesting insight. Another big theme that's been everyone's on mind is uh, China. Um, how 
its growth or the lack thereof um, it will affect the world economy and trade and therefore shipping. Um, Shmuel, I, I would think um, all the supply chain issues throughout the pandemic uh, have um, impacted your operations and um, perhaps your profitability. Um, you know, are things changing in that respect? Um, do you think these supply chain issues will continue in the near term? Uh, the supply chain problems affected our business, and thankfully for the good, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, now we are seeing improvement, and I think it's coming uh, from two sides, and that's why we are seeing uh, quite a dramatic fall in uh, container freight prices. On one hand, uh, we are seeing um, demand that slows down in uh, quantities into Europe and also into the U.S. Uh, are coming down. I mean, and on the other hand, this enables uh, the terminals to be more efficient, the rail to be more efficient because there is less uh, demand for them. So it means the turnaround of the vessels are faster. So actually it creates more supply. So we are seeing a bit of an increase in supply and a decrease in demand. Uh, and we'll need to see how this works out, but this is what we are seeing now, and uh, there is uh, overcapacity. We are seeing from our perspective, so we don't do long haul, but we are seeing uh, the main lines bringing more tonnage into the intra-Asia, which is a favorite dumping ground if you don't have anything else to do with the vessel. Uh, so it has uh, effects on, on the freight rate, and this will probably be, continue into 2023, I mean, we are now, we don't have too many uh, peak season come uh, maybe uh, until December where we have uh, the six, eight weeks before Chinese New Year that maybe a pickup will be then. Switching to a topic uh, that's perhaps not as heavy, um, but just as important, um, you know, as, as the world um, starts to dig itself out of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, you know, how does your workplace change or or not change? Um, you know, I for one have enjoyed working from home this past couple of couple of years and uh, have some mixed feelings about uh, about the push to go back to the office. Um, is is the hybrid work model um, here to stay? Um, Eric, I don't know if you have any thoughts. Uh, I'd say uh, definitely yes. Yes. I think I think it's here to stay. Yes, uh, I think it's it's uh, at the moment we are operating on three days in the office, two days uh, working from home, and you know that sort of flexibility. I think the it is it is extremely interesting to see. So you know yeah, there are a few things that one. That one the juniors are missing out uh, and, uh, on on learning through osmosis, you know, and that, you know, so so that element of uh, being there with your colleagues, that energy that actually comes from physical interaction, uh, is is one that is uh, I think we're trying to rebuild, uh, and you're seeing it in the results. It's not only hypothetical exercise. You know, we are seeing fundamental difference between the, 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 the people that have joined in a only physical in terms of their performance. Uh, only physical and only, you know, only uh, a Zoom environment. And therefore, do I believe that it's here to stay? I do think, but I also believe that increasingly we're seeing uh, those, those new joiners uh, wanting to be in the office, wanting to get to know uh, the colleagues uh, better. So it's going to be a mix and match. It's definitely, our lives are a bit more complicated as a result of that. You have meeting rooms and Zoom calls and, you know, some people are, you know, it's a mix and match, but it's it's interesting. And But is it here to stay? For sure, for the medium term, yes. Alan, um, is there anything unique about uh, running a shipping company that uh, makes it easier or harder to implement uh, you know, a hybrid work schedule? Um, I, I wouldn't say particularly. I mean, I think, um, as was touched upon, I think if you're in, in an industry like, I mean, I, I, in a previous life I was an investment banker, I don't think I could have learned what I did in the time that I did. 
if I hadn't been in an office environment. I think if I was working from home at that point, of view, uh, at that point in time, it would have been a very, very different experience. I think what we're doing um, as a small company where actually most people in the positions that they're in already are trained, already know what they're doing, that's been fine. It's been a good uh, experience on the whole. Um, I think it's elements of, of this hybrid working environment are, are bound to stay. There's, there's been some improvements in things. Certainly now we have more tools and we can do things in different, uh, in different ways from different places. And th there's more flexibility in that. But I think it still goes back to uh, the way you do business in generally. I mean, now that we can meet up, there's no uh, you know, replacing the benefit of meeting someone in person, of, of having a meeting, just as there's no replacing being in a work environment and having that um, structure to support at the same time as well. So, I mean, I, while I think there'll be some elements of the hybrid uh, kind of working schemes still running as we, as we move forward, I think, I think people will come back to the office as well. I think, I, but I do think some of it will stay. Yeah. I agree with uh, everything that was said here. Just one comment that I observe uh, being a more global company, it's also a question of geography. We see, in, for example, for us, uh, Spain are embracing, uh, we, we have a hybrid where you can do two days at home. So I, uh, I think in Spain, hardly anyone misses it, <laughs> the two days. And in Singapore, not many are using uh, the two days. So it's uh, also a cultural thing. I think we're starting to come to the end of our time here. Um, I certainly don't want uh, people um, from moving on to their evening plans here. Um, I think as we conclude uh, this conference, really you know, the one word that comes to my mind um, you know, that's going to stick with me on my plane ride back home is, is, is uncertainty. I, I suppose that that's always been the name of the game in shipping, but you know, it feels more, more acute this time. Um, you know, as, as leaders of your respective organizations, um, you know, as a final question, what, what keeps you up at night? We'll start with, start with Eric. Um, will uh, Rolling Stones uh, stop touring? <laughs> uh, um, now, I'll tell you what, uh, what keeps uh, Europeans up at night, uh, and that is electricity prices and interest rates. And I cannot underline how serious uh, that is uh, being spun by uh, European media. Uh, if I were to choose uh, just one thing, I'd say it's the war uh, in Ukraine. It's, um, um, it can potentially have a, a really uh, bad twist. Uh, so, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's a very unfortunate situation. And uh, so th that, that really uh, keeps me up at night. Serious. Eric stole my line about uh, the Rolling Stones, but um, no, uh, all jokes aside, I think from a banking, if you wish, point of view, from an um, industry that, that uh, you know, all, the whole of the team that, uh, that I lead, uh, loves and works for is, is in a very solid place. I do agree that geopolitical factors and the, the tension that we're seeing at the moment is significant. Mistakes can be made. Things could happen in the next few days and weeks uh, that could escalate situations significantly. And therefore, no one is prepared for that. You cannot, you know, you cannot uh, uh, put it in a box. And therefore, I, I will agree that I wouldn't call it only Russia, Ukraine. Russia, Ukraine is a sig is a significant tension, but uh, there is significant tension in many other places uh, that could significantly uh, deteriorate. Uh, so fingers crossed it doesn't happen, but you know, that's definitely one to, uh, to be on the lookout for. And it hasn't been, uh, for many of us, something that, that has been so acute and so significant in a very, very long time. Alan? Um, I think I stopped well, hopefully stopped um, staying awake at night worrying about things that I'm not in control of. Um, so, I mean, I think it's very personally the, the focus now. I'm in a reasonably um, privileged position from the perspective that the shipping company that I run is one that I helped set up and, and the owners that I have to answer to are myself and my uh, co-owners and colleagues. And so, really, if I'm not worrying about the things that I have no control over, then it's the things that I do have control over that could keep me up. And if I can't fix those, 
during the normal day, then I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing anyway. So, so that's the, the approach I take, is I'm not going to let the things, despite the magnitude, um, keep me up. I'm much better if I get a good night's sleep and I'm focused the next day. So I'll work in that way, I think. And if there's something wrong that is within my control, then I'll try and fix it. Well, I think uh, in from being in mainly in the container industry is the consumption. So interest rates and energy prices are going up. It means that uh, free income is going down and uh, things that are moving on in containers, uh, consumption will come down. And uh, we have quite a big order book. So these are the things. The main thing is uh, how I as uh, the CEO provide the flexibility to our line managers to be able uh, uh, to operate with the right capacity in the right trade. With that, I think our time is up. Thank you for a wonderful discussion. Um, thank you to the audience for uh, listening. Hope you, everyone had a good uh, conference. <laughs>